COVID made everything shut down. It was the perfect opportunity to try to start an online store for my own way. And I used what I, what I learned for that for the Fremont Art Association. And um, not to correct you there, but at, at, to date, I've probably taken over 2,500 photos for both organizations and edited about 2,000 of them. So, you know, at least they're digital. So some go by the wayside. But before I start, in, in the chat, if you guys, if anyone is interested in taking photos of their own work, if they're gonna post them online to a store or they just wanna learn to get better at it, if you can post what type of object you're photographing, um, it may, may be helpful for, for any advice on that particular type of things, but I'm just curious what kind of things people are photographing. So uh, I will go ahead and share my screen. I have a... Um, presentation here that hopefully will give you some ideas of how it is I do what I do. I am not a professional photographer. I'm not by any means a professional photographer, but this is what I have figured out from doing this for a while. If you have a three-dimensional object, you want to try to present it so that the person looking at it online can feel like they're interacting with it. And that's one of the things that I do like about this process is it it forces me to interact more with people's artwork. So I, I get a lot more out of seeing their stuff because I have to think about what is gonna make this appealing to somebody just looking at it online. So for example, this is one of my ceramic bowls, but just looking at this, it really doesn't give you a lot of information. It shows you the pattern and the color, but when you break it out into a few photographs, I usually try to focus on the overall shape something that gives it three dimensionality and some of the details to it. So for example, this is a pepper mill that my husband has done. It's a picture of the whole thing, it's a close up of the mechanism. And then I'll usually do a, a close up of the wood grain. And if it's interesting on multiple sides, I'll do that because people can't pick it up when they're shopping online. So for example, this item here, is it, what, what shape is it? Is it oval? Is it circle? You, you, can't, you can't really tell, circular. But when you do a few photos, you can actually see, and just like my ceramic box that I showed, I like to show if it has an opening, what's inside. Um, this is an artist at the Fremont Art Association that um, I did pictures for. This is another one where she makes her own journals, but all of them have these unique pages inside. So how are you going to show that to people in the easiest form so that they can see all the different aspects to it and actually feel like they know what they're purchasing? So here is my introduction introduction to what I use. Backdrop, lighting, camera, prop furniture. There's one little piece at the end that if I have time, I'll go into, but a sheet. You can get a back um, a drop cloth off of Amazon. Um, no patterns, no shiny, no texture. You want something that is going to fade into the background and let people focus on your items. These are all done with that drop cloth and you can see how you really see that particular item. It doesn't always work. This is Charlene Stark. She's gonna be in the Livermore online shop. The ribbon you can tell looks better on the white. The silver looks better against the black. So in a situation like this, I will take multiple photographs so that people can see all the different aspects of it. But in general, I think jewelry tends to look better on black, black velvet. Um, these three artists are also gonna be in the Livermore online shop. Charlene Stark, Peggy Curvin, and Nancy Hoover. And you can see how you, you don't even notice the background so much, but you really focus on those details and get to see the piece a lot better. So here's my lighting. It's two really cheap lights I got off of Amazon that I put these bright daylight um, saver lights, you know, the coil ones. I bought this big diffuser and I found that between my tripod for the camera and that big, huge light, it, I just keep bumping into it and it's, it's a mess. A lot of people suggest the um, photo tents. So just very quickly, I will say I have a photo tent. Yes, it's great. But if you're going through, as I said, 2,500 pictures, I don't want to have to keep putting something inside the tent and outside the tent. And if I'm frank about it, they've got Velcro around the top and my hair sticks to it when I've got it in a ponytail and it's just, I, I, I can't be bothered. So this is the setup that I really like to use. Um, so here's an example of uh, lighting up an object. The lights are there, doesn't quite work. I may be standing there holding the light over my head just so that I can make sure that everything is lit evenly um, just to get its best side. 
you can see here the difference between these two bowls. I noticed a shadow on one, so I retook the photo with the light in a slightly different spot, so you don't have that dark spot. And some of these you don't notice until after you've taken the picture, so it's, it's good to check your pictures as you go. Um, next important prop furniture. All of my prop furniture is basically anything within arm's reach that I can squish, crush, move, shove under something, because the end result, I want the bowl. I want that to be what's seen. I don't want, I, you could use a bowl stand or things like that, but sometimes, unless that's part of the feature, sometimes it's nice to just have the crisp image of the picture. <laughs> so this is probably my most difficult slide. The one on the left, is the Fremont Art Association front window. And we have all these things arranged so that as people walk by, they can see them. The picture on the right is what I designed um, on my setup right back here in my studio. What you can't see is that every single piece in my photo in the studio, those are all touching. The picture in the window, those are all set up for a nice display. But when you're taking a photograph, that whole adds 10 pounds things, it's, it distorts and stretches things apart. So when you wanna take a good group photo of items, you have to find a way to overlap them and stick them together so that you can fit more in one space. So again, now that I've covered all those things, back to some examples of capturing the item and then some details. I've showed you this one, I've showed you this one. Here's an example of a handmade purse. It's got pockets inside. How do you show somebody what the object is like without some additional photos. This is Jan Watling. She's another one of our artists for the Livermore, Livermore Art Association shop. Her work is so intricate and so incredible that you have to take these close-up picture, pictures. I probably took about seven or eight of this particular object. Also, even taking a picture of it somewhat flat so that it looked like an oval, just so you could see what it was you were purchasing. You could get an idea of the size and shape and exactly um, what it might seem like when you actually had it in your hands. So this is another item and this is probably more of a, a Helene thing that you're gonna wanna see the whole thing. So of course I have the behind on the kitty as well because you wanna see exactly the product that you're getting um, and be able to experience it in three dimensions even though you're only uh, shopping online. Three, so here's three another minutes, example. Only three minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another example of all, making sure you have all the different colors and variations. But those hands, these are fingerless gloves. It would be very hard if you just look at the ones down on the bottom, you can't really tell what those are. So in order to really sell the thing, sometimes you do, do need to invest in the little pieces that are going to make it visually more, um, more digestible. And the last part that I wanted to get into, I know Christine had mentioned, maybe don't get into things that you use an app for, but it's unavoidable and easy. I take photos on a digital camera and I do post-production all my pictures, but you can do this on a cell phone. If you're taking your pictures on a cell phone, you touch your photo, you see the word edit, you can do all of these same things. You can see the difference between these two before and after that, it can be stark. Um, there's five main things that I think will really help improve photographs. The first, just cropping it down. Cropping it down so you're only looking at the thing you want to. Second is increasing the exposure. If I were to set the exposure on my camera, it, sometimes it will, it will wash out the item getting that white to actually come up as white. So sometimes a little post-production can help bring back out the vibrancy. Adjusting the contrast, it's subtle, but I think it makes things feel more three-dimensional when you really increase the contrast between the colors because they're sharper and more crisp, so you experience the texture a lot more viscerally. Here's another example of a dull photograph that was not a terrible photograph, but the second one, I feel like it really pops a lot more, lets you see the wood grain and lets you see the product without over time, I realized my older photos, they all look very blue to me. And when you adjust a photo, I guarantee you, if you look at this slide, you can tell there's still blue on that white compared to the white of the slide, that it, your eyes take a while to get used to how much brighter something can be and how much better it looks. So this is the photo that I started my presentation with. 
the bottom one is my final photo and the top one is what it looked like before I did a lot of adjusting. So you can see just a little bit of cropping, exposure, increasing the um, contrast and doing just a little bit of temperature change to warm it up a little bit um, makes all of the difference. So that's it. I'm not a professional photo, uh, photographer, but um, I've been doing the product photos so you can take a look at the shops online and see what you think. I'm Jeff Faulkner and I am the current president of the Tracy Photography Club, uh, also the Tracy Camera Club um, out here in Tracy. Uh, I have a little bit of experience photographing uh, artwork, which is uh, something that we've done with the Tracy Art League. We've actually held a workshop and put together uh, an opportunity for artists to come bring their work in and photographers from the club to uh, practice their skills. Uh, so that might be something that you might think about running a workshop uh, where you would bring in um, a joint uh, effort there and, and everybody gets a, a little bit out of that. Um, I am a photographer, I take a lot of pictures. Um, I love to teach and I love to uh, help people often. I, I heard that earlier um, and that is something that actually resonates very well with me. Um, but one thing I am is I'm a committed lifelong learner. So I'm, I'm always looking for new ideas uh, and deconstructing things. I, I'm always trying to pick apart how something was done uh, and trying to figure that out. Um, and Aline, you mentioned that um, your uh, light stand is getting in the way of your photography. I do have a solution for you. The, um, the, there, there is some equipment that will help with that, um, but you have got a lot of great experience photographing objects. Um, I'd definitely uh, meet up with Helene because she's got some really good ideas there. Um, uh, the one thing I do want to note here is that, you know, if you're struggling with this, it, it's not because it's easy. It, it is hard. Um, trying to get a, a two-dimensional capture of uh, sometimes a three-dimensional piece of art is, is really challenging. Um, and I haven't always been successful with that. But, you know, the point is to practice, to learn uh, and to grow. Um, it can be very technical when you really get down to it. Um, so a couple of the things I wanted to talk about tonight would be uh, representing the artwork and, and what it is that you want to show. Um, one of the things that we need to do a lot is adding light and, and try to get good color representation of your objects. Um, and one of the challenges that we see are reflective surfaces. Uh, that was something that was mentioned in the video. So definitely watch the video. Um, and at the end here, I've got a link of a couple of um, videos that I put together with YouTube as well um, to kind of go over all the processes. Um, and one of the things we were talking about, if I'm, if I'm doing the, you know, the, the uh, painting, uh, which would be getting straight edges and making your artwork look um, like a piece of artwork. Um, so we're just gonna go through a couple slides here. Um, so first talking about representing your work, um, what is your goal? Think about what it is that you want to do with your photography. Um, are you trying to share or sell your work? Um, are you trying to uh, reproduce your work and, and actually like have a print made of it, like a lithograph or some other work? Um, are you trying to promote yourself on social media? Really think about what it is you're trying to capture uh, and that really helps uh, narrow down uh, how to organize and, and take those photos. Um, one of the things that I uh, talk with, with the, one of the artists that I uh, photographed in her home um, and she wanted to represent the artwork on the wall, uh, not just capture a straight capture, but she wanted to have somebody be able to envision that artwork hanging on their wall. So. Um, that might be a, a lifestyle type portrait represented, you know, not just um, here's the flat piece of work, but here's how it might look in your home. Uh, she also wanted to do some work uh, and show that she was heavily involved in the work. Um, so she actually put her hands in the photo and used some tools and, and made it look like she was actually working on the work at that moment. Um, and that kind of photography does take a second hand, you know, you need another person uh, taking that photo, uh, but it can, uh, it can be really beneficial. And uh, I've got some examples here at the end uh, that show just some interesting uh, photos of that. Um, if you are trying to reproduce your work for uh, lithograph, I, I tell you, I, I've taken some 
And they even said the quality that I produced wasn't even good enough. So I'm not exactly sure what is required exactly, but uh, there is a lot of equipment and process to getting that pro um, product uh, ready for sale uh, in that way. Um, and, you know, like I say, I'm always learning. Look, look around, see what other people are doing, uh, understand uh, what is being shared. And, and looking at some of those great photos that just came up with Aline uh, gives me really good ideas of how I could uh, take pictures. So uh, not everybody has a photo shoot studio, uh, including myself. Um, so when we're talking about taking pictures of your work, um, you might not have enough light, enough ambient light, uh, and sometimes you might be uh, tempted to add light. So one of the things that I want you to think about is, is light has a temperature. Uh, and when you're trying to capture something with your camera, uh, if you're trying to mix temperatures, let's say you've got sunlight coming in through your window and then you um, light up in incandescent light, your, your lighting is going to affect the color of what it is that you're shooting. Uh, and the camera is gonna get confused on how to do that. So think about what's already present in the room, uh, say daylight, uh, and then we can move and purchase bulbs that actually might match that, right? Like a 5,000 Kelvin bulb. Uh, and that way you stick with a, a similar light and the camera doesn't get confused. And some of that blue uh, casting that she showed on that photo in the, in the back, uh, the camera is always trying to adjust for white uh, actually, it's trying to adjust for a medium gray. Um, so at 18% at gray, uh, it's trying to find um, a balance between all the pixels. So if you've got a, a small object in a big white sheet or a big white, it's going to try and darken down that, um, that white uh, to get it down to 18% and just kind of average the whole scene. Uh, which is why software is really important because sometimes the camera is fooled. Uh, if you've ever taken pictures in the snow, uh, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about because you just put your camera on auto, you go out and you just take a picture and your picture just turns out horribly. It's, it's because the camera is trying to make uh, some decisions uh, and uh, it, it gets really confused. And one thing that can happen as well when you're adding in light is uh, it might add some glare. Uh, and you can move the light around uh, and try to minimize that glare. Uh, but three I do minutes, have... Jeff, three minutes. Okay, thank you. I do have another slide here that talks about that. Um, reflective surfaces. Um, in that video, they talk about removing the glass. If, if you've got a framed piece of work, uh, just take it out of the glass. Um, if your work is textured, that can be an issue. And I have shot some, some glossy work. Uh, no matter where I put my light, I could not get rid of the glass. Uh, the shine. Uh, what's really important here is to use what's called a polarizing filter. And um, and you can purchase those on Amazon for a um, for an SLR uh, and then just minimize the reflections. Uh, one of the things that wide angle lenses can do is they can distort your image. So you'll see um, bowing and pin cushioning. So you want to move back a little bit and then use a zoom lens, like a 50 to 100 millimeter, millimeter lens that kind of minimizes that distortion. Um, and then you want to line up perfectly with your um, subject. If you're down below or shooting up and you're going to get these odd angles, these converging lines, you're going to get a lot of weirdness. Um, you don't want to just center it in the frame, but you're going to actually have to um, get it lined up with the picture, but also note that if you're tilting your work back on an easel, you need to lift your camera up so that you're shooting directly onto that work. Um, this would help you get a nice square image um, and not a converging line image. Um, and it always helps to use a tripod. So one of the things I have here is a list of links. I'll put them in the chat after I'm done here. Um, one of them was a uh, link of uh, one of my wife's cousins. She's representing herself uh, with some of her artwork. And notice how she's using her hands. Uh, she is taking pictures, using her tools, things like this. Um, I also put together an Amazon wish list, uh, which is kind of a lot of the little things that could help you get good color, uh, use the lights. And down here, I just added, um, let's see if I refresh that. Here it is. I just added 
This is called a boom. So you have a little sandbag on one side and you can put your light on the other and balance it. And it does exactly this. It gets the light stand out of the way and you can shoot that light right over your surface without bumping into it from the camera. Um, other than that, I think I'm all set. Oh, and the, um, the playlist here. Um, so I, I went on YouTube. I found a bunch of different uh, videos that talk about how to shoot your art. And there's some really great ideas in here. Um, so it's just a couple of videos. Some of them are 15, 20 minutes long. Uh, one of them is 45 minutes. You can watch as you, as you long. I'll put the links in the chat. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, all of this pre these presentations and all of the links will be available to everybody off of the various organization websites. So everybody knows uh, for that. Because I did take a quick sneak peek at some of these and there's some great resources there at the end of this presentation. So thank you very much, Jeff. And I like your kitty in the background. He's very, <laughs> very pretty. Um, Okay, so on our last but not least, least is Rita Zolos. Era. Okay, so um, my name is Rita Zolos and I'm a local author and historian. And photography and hiking are two of my favorite hobbies. Um, I met Vanessa Thomas a few years ago when I was on the Dublin Art and Heritage Commission uh, back when Dublin Arts Collective was just a proposal. Uh, and today I'm here to do a quick presentation on Instagram and why it's a great platform for artists. Uh, this is just an introduction, not a deep dive. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards. Um, so let's go ahead and do screen share. Okay. And. Can you guys see that? Yes, yeah, hello. I can. Okay. Yep, we're there. So um, the, the first uh, one I want to talk about was community. As most of you know, Instagram is a wonderful visual platform. I have two accounts. Uh, one is called Wish I Was Trekking, which is kind of like a blog in which my photos and words focus on the outdoors and life as an author. And my other account is Tri-Valley Today, which has mostly outdoor snapshots of the Tri-Valley. Being on Instagram, whether it's the photos you post, your biography, or the words you choose to describe your photos, you have the ability to make connections with others and create your own community. You can choose to follow, uh, to search for ceramic artists. You can look for painters. You can get involved with other sculptors, knitters. The pol possibilities go on and on. You can aim for an international network or similar to my Tri-Valley Today account, it's most, it mostly, uh, your account mostly appeals to the local community and the people who used to live here or want to travel here. Um, this, uh, through Instagram, I found out about, um, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but um, Swati Rastogi Arts, um, Jen Hubret, uh, another artist, uh, Linda Briggs, who was featured earlier, um, a good friend now, uh, Deanna Tibbs, who works out of Oakland. Um, think of being on Instagram as a way of exchanging business cards virtually or hosting a show to an audience online. Once you start making connections and if you post your own creations, your name will start to be linked to that subject, whether it's watercolors, flower arrangements, cards, whatever you like to post about. So that's probably the next question. What should you post? When you first start, one option is to keep your account private and just post to yourself or connect only with close friends or family. This way you can get a feel for how Instagram works, but you can still pop around to see other people's public accounts and find out how best to represent your art. It doesn't need to be about quantity. It doesn't need to be one unique photo of one unique product each day. Instead, you can also talk about your process. 
you can talk about the ins and outs of trying to achieve your art. You can include con uh, the, the concept phase, drawings of what it is that you'd like to, your art when you, before you even start. You can throw in photos of yourself as you work. Let people see you so that they can form an additional connection. Um, you can post photos of work that inspires your own. You can find ways to include natural elements such as the branch that you see right here or take your art outside for a pretty garden setting or make it something seasonal with pretty um, autumn colors. You can also try different angles of the same artwork, close up, far away, you can mix it up. Lastly, get, you, would, you should get into the habit of reposting favorites from last month or throughout the year. You can do throwbacks, flashbacks, whatever you wanna call them. Repetition doesn't hurt because you may be reposting something that someone else loved of your work or uh, someone may be browsing your account for the very first time and they've never seen that one piece that you posted about many weeks ago. So if you're new to Instagram uh, you, and you're shy about starting or if you've never even thought about this before, I'd say download the app and just create a private account. This is my mom's, what I'm showing you here. Um, she started Instagram only a few weeks ago. With this private account, she is free to click on that small house at the bottom and she can view whoever she's following. Right now, I think she's only following, yeah, she's following six of us, that, that's it, just the family. But she can also click on this magnifying glass and she can search all of Instagram, uh, names, hashtags, whatever. Uh, and find public accounts that are run by people across the globe or right in her own hometown. She's on there, but keeping her account private, nobody else notices where she's snooping or browsing. And also notice that there's a message button to the top right of the page, which means that we all have the ability to send private message messages in this app too. The point is, you can just open a private account and that way you don't feel like you're throwing yourself onto a giant global stage. I'll close by, let me see, how do I stop sharing here? I'll just close by saying that, um, um, I think mine's frozen. Okay. Am I, okay. I'll just close by encouraging any artist who hasn't tried Instagram to create a private account and play around with the app. You can meet other artists around the globe or in your local community. You can find out that other processes, uh, other people might have the same process as you or different ones. Uh, you can discover new inspirations. And ultimately you can find out how being on Instagram can work for your art. That's it. For new inspirations. And ultimately, you can find out how being on Instagram can work for your art. That's it. Thank you so much, Rita. And now we know what to do with all the photos that we take. <laughs> so thank you. So now we are, um, now we can open up the floor for the, com for the, the questions. We have Rita, uh, Helene and Jeff to answer. Now, uh, Helene had put out the question about what people, what type of art people are photograph are looking for. Uh, so we had somebody with encaustic and it was highly reflective with no glass. Um, some of it are people who are concerned about photographing pictures that are under glass. Like some, if they've gone to the expense of having them professionally framed, a lot of artists do not want to have it like to have to take it all apart to take out the glass. Like ideally we know photograph it before it's behind glass, but you know, sometimes that may not be an option. Um, and then somebody also had a question, they've got some, and it might be for you, Helene, or anybody else who's got an idea on this, is they've got garden stakes. And they want, to, yeah, they want to photograph them without sticking them in the ground. So there we go, those are three. So let's start with, if you've got an idea, let's start with the garden stakes, Helene. Um, I do. Um, I, now, 
I, I understood it to be other than sticking it in the ground, but yeah. if you yeah. have the possibility of doing more than one photo, if I had to do that, I would take a photo of one of them and I would take a photo of one of them in the ground with a few others to the side of it demonstrating its action. So one is just the items themselves and the other is showing it actually in use and what you would do with it. Um, it's it's the only way people can really see it. And I'm just going to do a quick screen share if that's okay. Yep. Um, oop, that's not what I meant to share. Uh, Uh, maybe it's at the top. Eh, well, maybe I'm not. Um, it was a different item that had the same sort of shape and, and features to that, that that would show how to take a picture of that. But that's my advice. Okay. All right. Uh, and so does anybody have, like you did, Jeff, you did touch on encaustic and highly reflective surfaces. Uh, did you have anything, like you were talking about the polarized lens? Is there any hints about that? Yeah, the polarized filter, uh, it's kind of like when you buy a pair of uh, polarized sunglasses. Uh, and I've described it as when you're wearing your sunglasses, like it's the road is wet, but the sun is shining in and that light is just like hitting you right in the face. You can, you can wear these glasses and kind of tip to the side and you can tip your head one way or the other and the glare will just disappear, right? So um, that is one way you could do it. The The glass actually has, the filter has a uh, rotating uh, front. So you can put that on your camera and then you can spin it around. Um, and I did buy a pair of solar uh, polarizing uh, sunglasses as well. They do sell like little tiny filters for your iPhone as well. So if you want to clamp that onto your iPhone, uh, you could do that. Or even just hold like a pair of sunglasses up in front and spin. Um, I know in the video from Mike's camera, they say, well, this is, this is really only for the big SLRs, but I think there's something doable. Um, you also want to pay attention to the lights in the room. Um, and I'm going to hold up a really reflective surface right here. This is my iPad, right? And I've got a huge light right above me and it's shining down. And if we think about light, light, of course, travels in rays. So the reflections for this are going down to my desk. They're going this way. They're not going back at the camera at you, right? And I can make them go back to the camera at you, of course, by adjusting that angle. And you can see just how filthy my iPad is. But right, what we're seeing now is the reflection of just my computer screen, right? And you can see that it's really muted. And, and there's, that's just because that light is coming directly off the screen and shooting right into the camera. Right. So pay attention to those lights and the placement of the lights. If you have something that's glass, try to light it from overhead and then the reflection will go down to the floor. It won't go right back into you. Uh, and then take away those um, lights that are behind you. Um, so um, when I was photographing one of the pieces of art, um, she had her doorway and then her kitchen, which was bright and airy and it was beautiful and um, other, other rooms. I had to put up curtains and block all those other lights, right? Because those lights were shining directly at the piece right back into my camera. And all I got was a, it was a big glare. Um, so it was, it's, it can be done without expensive equipment, but you do have to be careful and, and light, light it and place it with the light. Um, I will note too, that if you're paying somebody to mount your work and mount it in a frame, they do sell a non-glare glass. So make sure that you're getting something that is, non-glare. Uh, when I'm selling uh, pieces of art, I would typically recommend glossy, um, like a four by six, right? It's something that's small, you can hold in your hand, you can kind of adjust the, the, um, the photo to get rid of or to just look through the gloss. But when it's on your wall, you don't want it shiny, you don't want it reflective, um, you want to be able to see that work. So if, if you're paying someone to mount it, uh, you definitely use that non-glare glass, uh, that will help as well. All right, uh, would that, so I have a few more, uh, would that, some of those hints also uh, work for uh, on artwork that is under glass? Like the polarized and all of that? Yes, the polarized. So once, once light reflects, it all comes back in the same direction and mm -hmm. a polarizer cuts all the light that's coming in that same direction, right? That's the so, technical term for how that works. So yeah, yeah it, would, it would just yeah. cut it. Um, and it's been described as well, like when you're, you know, 
going out fishing and that sunlight is reflecting off the pond, you can't see anything. You put on the polarized light uh, glasses, you can see right through the water. It's the same with the, with the glass. Right. Um, if you want to shoot at a museum or you want to shoot through glass, definitely use a polarizer. Okay. Uh, can I add, can I add yep. something to that? Mm -hmm. um, especially with the caustic, um, I did have to do a few photos and again, not, not for, for, for printmaking or for pre professional, just to get a decent photo of it. I was in a fairly long room far enough away from a window, so the light was so diffused at that point that if you use the remote on a, a camera, so some of my exposures took upwards of 30 seconds because the light was pretty low. Um, I also used a bunch of black sheets and had um, at one point a few masked volunteers stand up holding them so that any other potential reflection was blocked out. So it is possible, as he said, with cheap equipment, as in a bunch of fabric, to just completely block out anything that's potentially glaring and just have it take forever on your camera. You may need to do a little bit of adjusting post-production to get the tones right or bring out a little bit, but um, it's just time and you can't walk or touch anything because it'll vibrate the camera. Okay, all right. Um, and somebody was saying any hints about photographing at indoors at night? Um, I'd say the same thing with the tripod and you can't move around because you don't realize you move around, you bounce the tripod, you bounce the camera, so. Um, right. And you don't need to have a remote trigger. You can just set the self timer on your camera. So click it, it'll start countdown. Just if I'm already waiting nicely. 30 seconds, I'm not <laughs> waiting the additional two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, okay. but if you don't have the equipment, you can certainly get by with just using the self-timer and just hold still. Um, because especially if you're at, at night, the camera is going to hold that shutter open for a really long time. And you want to let it capture a nice still image and get all, all right. those colors. Okay. Uh, I guess there was another question here about... Uh, I'm guessing this is more of 2D, photographing vertically or a flat surface, which one would be better? Or are there, is there even a preference? Well, remember what I said in my presentation of getting directly to the center of that work. And if that work is, is tilted, you've got to get the camera up here. And if you've tilted the work you know, this way, you've got to get the camera directly over and looking down. So that's, that's one difficult thing to do if it's laying down. The next is um, when I was saying you, you don't want to be too close to your work because you're going to get that bowing edge uh, of a wide angle. So you want to be far away and zoom in. So then now you're something that's above and far up. It starts to get challenging, right, as you're, as you're doing that. I prefer to be in a room where I can control um, where my center is without like acrobatics. And then I can, I can scoot back um, and, and zoom in on the work, um, it, it tends to work. Uh, some of the work that I photographed was huge pieces, like six by nine. Um, they had a huge um, canvas that was wrapped around a board. They, they stood by themselves, right? So we, we set it up on a hearth and lifted it up off the ground. And then I could get right to the middle of that and you know just go back as far as I could. I was almost standing on her couch um, in a smaller room, but um, just just zoom in and and get that. Um, now, for someone like Instagram with a smaller piece of art, lay that down. Sure, absolutely. Use your iPhone, get above it, and and shoot down. Yeah, that that would absolutely work. Um, okay. Trying to figure out how to prop something up uh, that was a smaller piece of work might be more challenging than just laying it down, letting the light just kind of wash over it um, and uh, and capture it that way. Right. Okay, cool. Uh, Rita, question for you. Uh, what type of Instagram posts do you find get the best traction? Oh, that's a, that's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, uh, gosh, anything with pleasing colors. I think that's what people are looking for. Um, most people who are on Instagram scroll and they just want to see beauty. So, um, um, yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. I think it depends from account to account because um, once they get to know you, then they also want to see you every once in a while in the photos. Um, like I said, pleasing colors and um, um, switching things up so that not every single photo is a 
it is a is a photo of a bowl and another bowl and another bowl and another bowl and just endless lists of bowls, but but switching things up from photo to photo, uh, different angles. That's mm -hmm. the best I, advice I can give it in a short notice. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Uh, do we have any other questions? Anybody else have any interesting? I had one about um, the color used for when you're taking photos. If you're taking them indoors with and you're picking your light bulbs. Uh, I know you're supposed to get both light bulbs matching and stuff. What color range do you want them in? Is it better one end of the spectrum or the other? I don't know that it's any better one way or the other because the camera can adjust, right? So if, if you're taking an incandescent light, that you can set your camera to incandescent light and it will make that adjustment. My, my point is don't mix them. Uh, don't have an LED bulb overhead and then shine an incandescent light on it to light it up better and then have sunlight coming in, you know, from the top to, you're going to get weird colors and reactions right. from the different color lights. Uh, right. Stick to a, a single color and block off everything else. Okay. Uh, and here's another question. If you're shooting your artwork outdoors, what time of day is best or what sort of outdoor conditions are best? Fog. Foggy. <laughs> Foggy. You want, Overcast. You, otherwise, it's going to be, you're going to have all these it's the same as taking indoor photography with a flash. Mm -hmm. You're going right. to have really, really harsh uh, shadows. Mm -hmm. There is a concept um, in portrait photography called open shade, uh, where you could go in somewhere that's shaded but have open behind you, um, and you can pl prop up your artwork. Be in the shade, just like in the fog or anything else that's not in direct light, um, but have the bright source of light coming in and illuminating. Um, it could work. Um, that would make a really large uh, light source. Um, you could have the whole sky lighting up your work, uh, which could help with the reflection or it could hurt with the reflection. So right. uh, I guess it really depends. Okay. Here's another good question. It's actually a point I was thinking of. Um, at what point is it better to consult a professional or somebody who knows more than you do versus photographing your own work? I don't know if you're struggling. <laughs> try I mean really get out there get your get your iPhone really try it out and and yeah. if you don't like it then try something else um, I I love to learn right and I'm sure you guys all do too this is why you're you're doing this kind of thing it's all creative and, and growing um, if you have a lot of pieces it can be challenging um, especially if you're setting up um, like I was doing for this one uh, artist out here in Tracy uh, she had probably 40 pieces that she wanted to capture. Um, that's like a couple hours worth of work. Um, and if I'm setting up lights in a studio and, and trying to make something work in her home, I'm going to be there for two to three hours um, for, you know, and that's me moving through picture after picture, right? And if you're going to do it, it, it could take a long time. Uh, and if you're if you're not reviewing your results as you go, you could get to the end and be really disappointed with everything and have to do it all over again. Yeah, right. And I wanted to say, I wanted to add to that too, that um, if you, um, if you're the, when you're the artist, you want to try and have some control of how you're represented online too, because if you have a photographer come in, it'll be kind of their vision that they're applying to whatever website or look that you want. Um, if you can maintain some of that creative control, that's great because when you, when you take the photos, you're the one who's trying to show whatever it is to the audience, how, how you see it as well. So there are some creative decisions as, there too, if you can try and maintain it. Okay. Right. So I have two more questions and then <laughs> we're, we're coming up to two hours. So, and we still have... So, um, so we'll take a couple more questions and then we'll close the meeting, but then we can stay online for anybody who wants to ask more questions. I have one on for you, Rita. Do you, for your Instagram photos, do you take, use a DSLR or an iPhone more or your, your phone more? Um, your I, I use, I use my, my camera, my camera camera more. Um, uh, but the iPhone, I always have it in my back pocket. And if I just can't seem to get the settings on my camera, I take one real quick with my iPhone just so I don't lose the moment or the light. 
Um, but um, yeah, I, I just love my camera so much. I carry it in my purse. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Helene, what was the most fun object you've taken a photo of? Oh boy. Um, I really meant what I said about um, appreciating objects that much more after being able to um, photograph them because you really have to think about how to do them. But I think, I think one of the ones that I enjoyed the most was um, those handmade journals because um, trying to figure out how it, you're going to want to pick that up and you're going to want to open it and how to figure out how to get that um, visually represented, how to make, you know, I, I'm, I'm posing the book as carefully as I can to get the pages to, to divide out. Um, but I will say fabric is the easiest to photograph. I love photographing fabric because the camera likes it, the light likes it, there's no glare, it's easy. So those ones I can go through faster. Okay. Cool. Uh, so at this point, I want to thank you three so much for this. We are going to conclude, but if you want, if, if you're willing to hang on, we've got, we do have a few more questions, but I will formally close the meeting and say everything we will have is posted. Contact information for you will be available that people can send you questions. Sure. Are you amenable to that? Okay. I, I, not I, to I, put you on the, not to put you on the, but we'll make them follow you on Instagram, Rita. <laughs> I do need to run because my 10 year old yeah. needs me um, before she goes to sleep. So I, I wanted to log off. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much for, for contributing. It's I great appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Okay, so thank you everybody, whoever is wanting to stick around. We still have 36 people. I had a couple more questions. One was, uh, let me go back up for a little bit. Um, can I interrupt you there for one second? Yes, you can. Okay, um, you asked the question, do you take pictures for Instagram with your SLR or with your phone? Yeah. The workflow for taking pictures from your SLR and posting to Instagram is incredibly challenging. Um, I would not recommend trying to do that to get started. Um, Instagram is meant to be a mobile website uh, and or a mobile app, not a website. And using and uploading photos from your computer, um, they've made it difficult. Um, so if you're getting started and you don't, you're not really familiar with the process, definitely use your phone. That's my recommendation. You, you have to import the photos back to your phone to actually get them yeah. on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I've gone through that process. It, it, I mean, it's even challenging from your, not even challenging. I'm pretty sure the professional phone. Instagram sites, they definitely use well-crafted photos. I've seen an Instagram okay. feed where you notice everything is white, gray, and blue, except one little bit of orange. It could be skin. It could be some, it's so curated. You know that it's a professional photographer putting it together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And they used to have for plugins. For the rest of us. Yeah. They used to have plugins for Lightroom that would you know, instantly upload to Instagram. You could just make a little collection and you could just push, push, push. And all day long, I was posting photos. Can't do that anymore. Everything's been oh, blocked. No. Oh, no. Oh. Okay, so another question was, on the iPhone, portrait mode or regular? Portrait mode or regular? Um, okay, landscape. And I, I guess think, that's landscape. No, no, yes. so, no, portrait mode on an iPhone is different. Oh, it's the newest. Mode, I see. Yes. It, it helps fade things into the background. So I don't tend to use my phone for product photos, but it is a good idea to use that because it does help you focus in on the object. But the other feature that it does is it helps drown out the noise. So the particular way I'm doing things, I've already kind of taken the effort to get rid of the noise behind it. So it's not necessarily relevant to the way I'm doing photos. Um, but if you are taking pictures of a product where you cannot control for the rest of the environment, or you're trying to take a picture of that one thing in a group, and it, that's just how it has to be, I, I think that would probably be a good, pretty good way to go. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the technical behind that is that little cell phone camera puts everything in focus from front to end. And if you're trying to focus on just your product and get rid of that background, um, using a portrait mode, like on your um, on your newer and more expensive iPhones, um, uses software and computers to put it all together and blur out the background, and just brings that attention to your product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know you can do it on a, on an Android phone. I just can't remember, and I think most Androids are different. But 
whatever you can do, you can always take a look uh, at your, your phone. Um, I always poke, poke at buttons and test all the different stuff. So I know you can do it if you press on your camera, on your phone, press on the object and it'll zoom the focus to that object. So. Um, you know, and it's, it's digital. We're going to be buried in digital files at some point, but it can't hurt to take two sets of photos. Um, and what he mentioned of if you don't check your photos until you, know, you may get home and realize I've, I've taken photos of some particularly shiny pottery that wasn't mine. And I had to do it in low lights to, because the shine was just so obnoxious that it, it started to look like a feature on it, like a white slash instead of just being able to tell it was shiny. And I had to keep taking the card out and putting it in my computer because trying to make sure I got the color correction, you want to make sure you take a couple in a, diff a couple different modes because if you just take three pictures of the tripod in the same setting in the same way, you're going to get three pictures that maybe didn't work. So right. change it up a little bit. Check if you can. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about getting colors. So getting j those jewel colors correct, is there any way of being able to do it while you're taking the photo rather in post-production? Nope. <laughs> no, try, I guess try I some of those different settings. The, the thing that you have to realize is the camera is computer software and it's making all kinds of adjustments and corrections for you. And sometimes it's losing colors and, and saying, well, I think you know, some engineer in some other country said, you know, when I'm taking a picture that kind of looks like this, this is the right or the correct setting. It's never going to be what your artist vision is. It's not going to represent your work um, the way you want it to. Um, if I'm going to do it professionally, I'm going to get a color swatch and I'm going to, you know, actually photograph color in that light. And then I'm going to go back to the computer and say, okay, the reds, they should look like this, but they photographed like that. And the computer can make adjustments to fix all of that. Um, but that's way beyond, you know, just iPhone, Instagram photos, right? Yeah. Um, but the, the brightness, contrast, color adjustments, those are all like perfect. You know, take the photo and then make those adjustments. And they're easy to do on a phone. Even if you're just using a phone, you hit edit. And the, the main ones that I mentioned, um, there's always a vibrance or a brilliance and that will really bring out those jewel tones if they faded um, a little bit more saturation. Just don't go too far so it looks absolutely ridiculous, but um, subtle is good. One app I love to use is called Snapseed, which used to be a Google product. I'm not sure if it is or not still has a lot of control. Yeah. 